So as we continue to study the book of Philippians for God's call to walk worthy of a practical unity for the gospel, we're going to talk about a proven servant of Jesus Christ. God uses a number of examples, examples to illustrate this. First being the illustration of Jesus Christ himself as the ultimate example of humble thinking. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And because of his humility, God the Father exalted him above every name. We have another example that was used, previously taught about the Apostle Paul. He was an example as well of a mind and humility that existed. In verse 17 of Philippians 2, talks about who being poured out as a drink offering on a sacrifice and service of your faith, knowing that it was God working in him as far as the Apostle Paul, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He was a humble and submissive mindset. As we go into the third example of Timothy as an illustration of a mind and humility in the thinking and service for others. Let's read Second Timothy, uh, Philippians 2, verses 19 to 24. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Therefore I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord, that I myself also may come shortly. Paul was, was writing this from his imprisonment in Rome. As we learned last week, while Paul, um, in his absence, dissension surfaced in the church of Philippi, causing the disunity within the local church, and the fruit of it showed itself in complaining and disputing. Paul challenged them in verse 12 to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. We saw that this area was in the second tent salvation, sanctification of the believer. So Paul encouraged them that it was God that was working in them, both to, to will and to do of his good pleasure, that they should shine as lights in a crooked and perverse generation. As we continue in Philippians, let's start with a little history on how Timothy came to be a Paul's companion. In Paul's second missionary journey, starting from Antioch, as he traveled, he went to Lystra and Derby. And here it actually is where Timothy, I mean, Paul actually picked up Timothy on his missionary journey early on. And then he continued on to Troas and up to Philippi and around to his journey. And this is where the church we're talking about is right here. And then he continued on to his journeys on his second missionary journey. Philippi Church started with Lydia and the Philippian jailer. You know the story, Acts 16:31. How Paul, did Paul find himself in a situation, but he wasn't complaining. His testimony one of glorifying Jesus Christ. Even though all the allegations and justices laid on him, he was beaten, thrown in prison, but he rejoiced in the Lord. And this was the start of the Philippian church with Lydia and the Philippian jailer. As we look where, the, where it was written, you're looking at uh, Paul's imprisonment right here in Rome. This is where he's writing the books here. You see the four books. And Philippi is the one we're looking at right now, Philippians. And this is Timothy was on both of these journeys with him as he traveled. And he's speaking right now from his first imprisonment in Rome. I would like to look at this portion a little differently. Uh, look at it from a team ministry perspective. And you will see that God uses many faithful and humble servants 
human instruments to carry out his will. As we read in Philippians 2, verse 19, we see, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your estate. Why would we realize the value of a team ministry? There's a purpose for it. And why is because teamwork is not foreign to us. We see it every day in our life. We see it at work in order to get a project accomplished. It takes teamwork. We see it on the, in high school, in grade school. Where we go in school, you get the teamwork of ch children playing on a team. We, get, we like to see it in our family as teamwork to accomplish whatever plans we have and just to enjoy fellowship with one another. We also see it, of course, in our games of teamwork to get the ball down the field. Of course, some members or teams are better than others. <laughs> but when the team falls apart, mainly because the members are not working together, they're working independent from each other, what happens is it falls apart, and usually complaining sets in, and the game is lost. Paul was very concerned about this because he heard about the condition of his beloved church, Philippi. He heard that there's discord beginning between believers. And he wrote this letter to exhort them to be of the same mind, of the same love, do all things without complaining and disputing, knowing that it was God that was working in them, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, not by selfish ambitions. So having a faithful, trustworthy team is of great value when it comes to two things. Addressing the specific needs that arise in a local church. In every local church or mission team, there will always be special needs. Issues, problems that will always arise. But none is without its own problems. It is true of the Church of Philippi, and it's also true of DBC. Another value that you consider is of a team is the final vital ministry information for spiritual leadership and others to know in making decisions and discerns on what's going on. When it's the ministry, when it comes to functioning as a or you're teaching within a local church, a mission team, going into a foreign country, or even just raising of your family. Three points are brought out, brought out in this, and what, what's needed for this, for this team function to work. The very first thing, of course, is ultimate trust in the Lord. Paul brings that out in verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus. That is top priority when it comes to functioning in the team ministry. Paul's ultimate confidence was in the Lord's ability through his divine and sovereign will to work out his plan. Even though Paul was in prison, not knowing what circumstances was going to uh, fall out on him, uh, he could trust in the Lord. The Lord could work out all things for his glory. This is where the amazing grace of God fits in. God has always used human instruments to fulfill his will, especially in today. So we need to recognize that God uses these instruments as well. No one is an island unto themselves. God has chosen us as team players with him to work out his plan of the ages to reach the loss for salvation, to bring glory to his name. Have you really thought this through as you wake up in the morning? It's illustrated in this one verse here. To them, which is referring to the prophets, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They, the prophets, are ministering to things which are now have been reported to you through those who have been preached the gospel to you. Notice all the human instruments. All the ins instruments, human instruments, God is using by what power? By the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And this is so amazing that even the angels are looking into it, looking down from heaven. How is God getting his will done through these, these dumb sheep? But he does. That's the amazing grace of God. Hebrews 11 is also recorded of great many heroes of the faith from all walks of life. You have kings, carpenters, landowners, teenagers, cowards, scoffers, and prostitutes. 
all of whom trusted in the Lord, which is the only requirement to be on God's team. A faithful servant also needs to be entrusted to the ministry. Paul had such a man. Paul had no one else who shared with the same like-mindedness that he had. Like-mindedness literally means like-souled, thought like he thought, desired what he thought. Serve the Lord with all humility. And Timothy was such a man, a true son in the faith. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul was to entrust this treasured servant of, Paul, of Timothy to go to Philippi and find out the vital ministry information that was needed. What, what normally does this result in? It results in effective ministry being shared. When a team first comes together, at first they do not think alike. They're all looking out for them, themselves at first, but if they're looking to the Lord for wisdom, understanding, and the grace to go on, looking to serve for the greater purpose and goal, and not to be served, but to serve, they will value the importance of each member. It's like many colors of the rainbow that come together. It brings beauty, not unrest. Timothy was one of Paul's missionary members. He teamed with Paul on his second, on his second and third missionary journeys, and he had developed an effective minister of the gospel. As a father sending his son, Paul entrusted that the Philippians will receive him as though he was Paul himself, Paul's second self. He knew that Timothy would report back to him with an accurate spiritual account as though Paul himself was there. So there was a lot of comfort for him knowing he was sending Timothy. There's a lot of good work that goes on into a ministry and not, not the thing that is really needed is one spirit in the body when it really gets tired. So when you're tired in the mission field, it's very encouraging to know that there's others up there praying for you, working with you, uh, those who you think alike, and you're upholding one another. So it brings per personal encouragement to you. Colossians 2.2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and the of Christ. If you've ever been on a team that have served with the same focus, the same drive, the same mind, it's really amazing. And it's very encouraging. It's like um, Energizer Bunny. You just keep going and going and going. Why? Because you're united in the Spirit of God, which is your power source. You just keep moving. Stay late at night, you wake up early. And for some reason, because of the unity of spirit you have and the same focus, you just keep going. Paul knew by sending Timothy that the issues that he was facing by the Philippians would be properly addressed. It would comfort Paul knowing that his beloved son in the Lord would soon be sent and issues addressed. It would be like Pastor Dennis hearing disturbing news of what's going on in El Salvador. Dissension, dissension setting in, internal submission issues, and he was unable to go himself. He would eagerly wait to address it and hear the state of his churches. He might even send tail around to the churches and report back to him as soon as possible so he could be comforted. The like-mindedness that he shares with tail would put him at ease knowing that he was sending one that he could truly say, I have no one like-minded that would sincerely care for your state. He also would be anxious to go himself and see his beloved saints because he has spent so many years ministering to them, seeing them grow in the Lord. Pastor might even send a small trustworthy team from Duluth to El Salvador to assist Tail in the care of the churches. Men like Timothy and Tail are invaluable. They're priceless. Not only do we need to see the value of this team, but we need to recognize and appreciate the faithfulness of these humble servants. And why is that? Because there are few of them. Paul had no one like-minded, as was Timothy. 
As he journeyed with Paul in his second and third missionary journeys, many churches were established. Timothy learned much during these travels. Timothy had a tender, submissive, humble spirit. He was able to grow steadily as he conversed with Paul on the grace of God as he traveled on the roads from town to town. Paul had, some of the, Paul had the same desire for the Philippian believers as well. Fulfill, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Paul carefully taught Timothy not only the great doctrines of grace, but also the hands-on effects of grace in the lives of believers. It was actually grace in action. As Timothy traveled side by side with Paul, he personally had gone through some of the same intense trials and affliction as Paul did. Timothy's passion and love for the church grew as he ministered with Paul, and Paul saw him as a true, faithful, beloved son. I challenge you to go home today, look in the mirror. Ask the person that is looking back at you, are you one of the few? Am I a faithful servant that could be entrusted? Another reason why we should need to recognize faithful and humble servants is because they will need to be sincerely, they will need to sincerely care and minister to others. Someone who has a true general concern for others. This is not only something that you're born with. Remember, you're born with what? Me first, right from birth. Let's look at Timothy's upbringing a little bit. Timothy upbringing, 2 Timothy is 1. 2 Timothy 1.5, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your mother, grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is also in you. Timothy learned from a young age to enjoy the scriptures, to understand God's word, grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. So mothers... What a ministry impact you might have on all your children. And remember, Timothy here didn't have, a, didn't have a father. Eunice didn't have a husband to have this kind of impact. Timothy's father was probably unsaved, or at least of no spiritual influence in his life. But what a testimony impact Lois and Eunice had on Timothy. Timothy grew to love the Lord and his word. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. But you trust, you must trust continually in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing that from whom you have learned them, and that from a childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Then on Paul's second missionary journey, Timothy was recognized by Paul in Acts 16.1 on his first travels there. And Paul, Paul saw Timothy and his desire for the Lord. He says, I want this man on my team. He's faithful. He's true. He's genuine. He saw he had a submissive, humble, spiritual developed character. I can work with this man, Paul said. And Timothy went along, continuing to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. It can also be said of Timothy in Philippians 1, verses 9 and 10. And this I pray, that you love me abound yet more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense to the day of Jesus Christ. Another point we need to recognize for faithful men is because this humility and service in to others is supernatural and not natural. Why is that? Because in verse 21, what does it say? For all seek their own. This is one of all seek their own interests. What's in it for me? How can I benefit? A few verses on it are Jeremiah 17, 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart has departed from the Lord. 
2 Timothy 4.3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And 2 Timothy 1.15, This you know, that all those who have Asia turn away from me. All of Asia has turned away from Paul during that time. That had to be hard for him. You can trace all problems in the local church, in your home, or even at work to this one phrase. All seek their own interests, not the things of others. When you wake up in the morning, what is your first focus? What is your first drive? What's your first interest? How about Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday? How about we're sitting here right now? What's your interest? Let's go to Luke chapter 10 as an illustration. We'll start with verse 38 to 42. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went that Jesus Christ, who was the Messiah, entered to a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed them into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Christ's feet and heard his word. You can see the situation. His Messiah himself is welcomed into her home. And what is Martha doing? She's serving. But how is she serving? As you look, look at the other verses, she's serving for her own interests. And why do I say that? She was very busy, very active, making sure everything was right. House was clean. Food was right. Everything was just prepared just excellent because I am the Messiah on my own. I've got to impress him. The reason why I say that's that attitude, but look at the next verse. But Martha was distracted with many, much serving. And she approached Christ and said, Look, Lord, do you not know or do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. It's not well enough for her to just serve the Lord selflessly. Just on to the Lord as you're sitting there, just enjoying the fact that others can listen and learn and be taught by Jesus Christ right in her own home. Why was she distracted? Why didn't she just enjoy knowing that others are learning and she, her ears can be perked up as she's doing her things and taking care of the needs of having a welcome desk, uh, guest at her house? I th I'm sure Christ wouldn't mind all of them just sitting around listening, enjoying fellowship. I'm sure Christ wouldn't care if the, there was two Jack's pizzas in the oven. He wouldn't care if there's a pile, uh, 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 a pile of uh, clothes in the corner waiting to be washed. He wouldn't care whether the table was perfectly laid out right. He was more interested in what? He would love to have both those eager hearts yearning for fellowship and learning of the ways of Christ. And what did Christ say to her in verse 41? And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. And what was she doing here? Thinking she was serving the Lord. And was she? No, for her own interest. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. So if you're a Sunday school teacher, Kids wrapped around your neck. Remember, we're very thankful that we can hear the word of God. While you're out there battling the war for us. So we can relax in here knowing that they're in good hands, entrusted Sunday school teachers or nursery people that they're entrusting their kids with. Knowing they can sit out here and relax, take in the word of God, and just enjoy the scriptures. So next time you're in there, serving, make sure you're serving is on to the Lord. 
So can you lay aside housework? Can you lay aside fishing for a spiritual benefit of another? Can you let it go for the need of another? For the true service for Jesus Christ? So you can see here that humility and selfless service is supernatural. Only as you abide in the vine can this selfish ambition be interrupted. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. A humble, spirit, a humble servant needs, to be, needs also to recognize one other thing. They also need to seek the things of Jesus Christ. It's one thing to not seek your own interests, but there's got to be a focus, a direction. You don't clean your house for a purpose of not filling it. And the purpose is to seek the things of Jesus Christ, a new focus, a new recognition. So what are some of the interests of Christ? Uh, I've got to make this short. You could spend m months on interests of Christ. We've got to cover just three, three areas. First of all, when a unique God-man, right from birth, he said, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offerings you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Then I said, Behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. In submissiveness and humility, Christ wanted to be united with the Father's will. And during his ministry, Christ prays for the unity for the believers. In John 17, verses 20 and 22, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Christ prayed for this unity for believers. Then as Christ was seated in the heavens, his will is that, we be like-minded. Romans 15, 5. Now may the God of patience and comfort, comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. And his desire is the goal of the ministry. And what is that? 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So what happens in team ministry when the grace, humility, and the mindset of serving others is not present? What happens? Nothing. Nothing when it comes to what's profitable for Christ. Nothing when it comes to a spiritual influence of believers or souls being reached for Jesus Christ. Even though you might become very popular, inquire many things. But instead, what it usually ends up with, and the fruit of serving others from a selfish ambition, is that. If that's flaring up, that should give you a little bit of an indication who you're serving. Or maybe that one. We all whine once in a while, don't we? Why? Because our selfish interests weren't satisfied. How about this one? Frustration. You want God to answer things your way. And you're in turmoil instead of relaxing in God's provision. So is this true of Timothy? Philippians 2.22. Okay, let's get back to Philippians. Chapter 2, verse 22, and the next verse. 
But you know his proven character, that the son with his father has served me in the gospel. Timothy served Paul in Paul's longest two missionary journeys. He cared for him all the way, struggled with him all the way. And after many years with Paul, he became a pastor at Church of Ephesus. And what are some of the titles and recognition given to Timothy during his travels? In Paul's missionary journeys, he was given the title of my fellow worker. In all his missionary journeys, all the way from Acts 16 to Acts 20, you can read Timothy scattered throughout those pages. You find it in Paul's many epistles. Romans, Corinthians, Philippi, Colossians, Thessalonians, Philemon, Hebrews. You see, in all these different books that are written, Timothy is mentioned as a faithful sermon of Paul. He traveled many places with Paul, serving him, learning, developing. And he soon became a pastor because he had that heart that God has created in him. From where? Right from a childhood. He has learned the Holy Scriptures. Very valuable. And Paul's help in other churches. He was given many titles. He's called my beloved and faithful son. He has said he does the work of the Lord. Our brother and minister of God. And a reporter of good news. He wasn't a complainer. He wasn't causing strife. He wasn't bothered by all the insults he might have received or the problems of churches. He reported of good news. Some great titles that was given to him. Why? Because he was humbled. Just wanted to serve the Lord, not his own interests. Paul gave two personal letters to Timothy. And in those letters, he gave them beloved names. One of which is the true son in the faith. And the other, a beloved son. Therefore, after all this, what were Paul's plans? What was going to go on from here? Let's verses, uh, read verses 23 and 24. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I know, see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Timothy had a great desire, I mean, Paul had a great desire to go to Philippi. And Paul wanted Timothy to go at once. Why? Because Paul was confident in the Lord that all things were worked out for the glory of God. Therefore, because of Christ's character in Timothy as Paul's beloved son in the Lord, Paul was extremely anxious to send him to Philippi. But first... He must see how things are going to go out and pan out for him at Rome. We really don't know the details there, but we do know that Timothy was needed for the current affairs that was going on in Paul in prison there. Uh, whether it was imprisonment to continue or be released, it's obvious Timothy was needed at the time. But as soon as he found out what his situation was going to be, he was going to send Timothy at once. But I trust in the Lord that I myself as well will also go. And Paul's desire to reach. So you see the team function here, working. As uh, next lesson, you'll learn about Epaphroditus. Because Paul and Timothy couldn't go instantly, he decided to send Epaphroditus immediately with this letter that he was writing. 
to com comfort the Philippian believers and to challenge them and try head it off in the past. Paul had a great desire to nip things quickly and is very important. I recently had a colonoscopy. And I entrusted myself to everybody in that room. And I'm glad they worked as a team. Uh, when it was all over, I went home waiting for the letter and the results. And it, was, and it actually went pretty well. And I got this letter in the mail, and I'm thankful for the team. Because they found a pellet, and they did a biopsy on, biopsy on it. It was only six millimeter, very pretty small. You know, but you, you do those things because my age, not that I'm getting old, but, but I'm getting retired. So the, the notice said that they, this pallet they found, six millimeter, was cancerous. But they got it all, got it in time, and they want me to come in again very quickly and within three years at the most. And they're going to send me a letter to remind me that they wanted me to put it on the calendar to remind myself but you can see the functioning to be able to nip it in the bud, catch it early. And that's what Paul wanted to do here. He wanted to catch it in early. Yodius and Syntyche was squabbling about something. And we get a lot of squabbles within the local church. Most of them are meaningless. But if you don't nip it right, nip it quickly, challenge it properly, it could spread fast, just like cancer can. You got to get it. You got to deal with it quickly. And Paul knew that. He had a heart of a pastor. He had a heart for the, those believers. And Timothy also was developing the same way. And you can trust him in that. And you'll hear later of Epaphroditus as well as a team function working together. What a great ministry of a function with like mindedness, same goals, same objectives, moving forward for the gospel and the clarity of it to winning souls before it's forever too late. The ship is going down, guaranteed. So may we be faithful in the clarity of the gospel, not seek our own interests, but those of others, the things of Christ and his interests. This is like a sandwich. Paul took the sandwich approach here. Look in verse 19. Verse 19, what did he start with? I trust in the Lord. Then he went on and made his plans, talked about a few things. Then he ended with what? But I trust in the Lord. He entrusted those plans before the Lord to work them out. So, so what Paul did, he sandwiched the state of Philippi and bathed it in prayer and in trust in the Lord. It was like two slices of trusting in the Lord, and inside there is our plans. And that's how all of them should be. Paul was very confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.6. So we need to do this in our lives, function this way, trusting in the Lord, beginning to the end. And everything in between, whatever it might be, God will work those things out. God knows that there's great value in raising up key men for the ministry. He knows that. And he'll work. And you know where he starts working? From the very day of salvation. Is your heart wanting to know, to be used of the Lord in that manner? For God uses many helpers needed, and he knows there's many helpers to function within team ministry. So we need to recognize and appreciate these faithful and humble servants of the Lord. And in closing, is this true of you? Can you function faithfully as to the Lord? Trusting in the Lord? In the local church? At home? Nursery? Surveying, college, are you a light in the world of this crooked and perverse nation? 
or you are seeking your own self-interest and you're complaining. Acts 16, well, Paul was, if Paul was complaining in that jail because of all the injustices laid on him, how do you think it would have turned out? Not the way it did. Philippian jailer gets saved, his family gets saved, and many of them, the, the cellmates, did they run off? They didn't run out of the jail. It says all are still here because they all were enjoying the fellowship and the joy of Paul and, Ty, Paul and Silas as they enjoyed the Lord, rejoicing in the Lord in their situation, no matter how unjust it was. And that fruit and that spirit and that light shine on everybody in that prison. May we shine as lights as we faithfully serve the Lord, trusting in Him, functioning as a like-minded member of the body of Christ. So we close in forward prayer. Father, do thank you for Jesus Christ who made this all possible. We who are sinners by nature, he saw us needing of salvation on the way to hell, unable to fulfill anything that was acceptable before you. But you sent your son and paying our debt for us on the cross, paying our penalty that we justly deserved. He took our wrath upon himself. He bore our sins. He was rose victorious. So we, by faith and trusting in his finished work on our behalf, can also be raised victorious by just trusting in what he has done. So thank you, Father, for his humility coming to the cross and die for us.